fit test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1 You will hear a telephone conversation between a language student and an advisor. First you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Homestay Language Learning, Lisa McDowell here. How can I help you? Hello, my name's Dan. Hello, Dan. And I'm going to be living with a family in Edinburgh for three months, so I'd like some advice on what to bring with me. I'm flying in via Singapore on the 15th. Right. Well, perhaps most important of all are your documents. Vaccination certificate, sponsor's letter, and the certifying letter from us for immigration. Yes, I've got all those in order, I think. What I'm really wondering about are money and clothes and things for my room. Personal effects, in other words. OK. Let's start with cash. You'll already have money in your bank account here, of course, but make sure when you get here you have some cash on you. Pounds, that is, not euros or dollars. How much do you suggest? I'd say 50 as an absolute minimum. OK. Now, the next thing is which clothes to bring. What do you think? Well, as I'm sure you know, it can get pretty cold here, so you will need some warm clothing. There are shops near here that sell winter clothes quite cheaply, so you really don't need to bring much. Do make sure, though, that you have at least one thick sweater and a jacket with you when you arrive here. The temperature is likely to be a lot lower than in Singapore. Oh, thanks for the warning. Now. Something else I'm not sure about is whether to bring my computer. It's a laptop, so it won't take up much room. Two problems. Firstly, it might not be compatible with the electricity supply in this country. And secondly, there's a risk of it getting broken in transit. Someone travelling here had hers smashed only last month. But surely I can carry it as hand luggage? Usually, yes, but because of all the tight security right now, you may have to check it in. So my advice is to leave yours at home. OK, I think I will. Is there anything else you'd advise against bringing? Well, you won't need household or cooking things. They'll all be provided. And importing food, of course, isn't allowed by customs, though I imagine you already knew that. Well, yes. But there are one or two things I'd suggest you find room for in your suitcase. Yes? Perhaps a few of your favourite cassettes or compact discs. Of course, you might be able to find them in the shops here, but then again you might not. That's a good idea. Anything else? Yes. Some photographs of people and places that are special to you could be nice. They can really make your room feel like home. <laughs> it's just a thought. I'll see if I've got a few good ones. <laughs> Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Just a few points about packing. Make sure all your cases are clearly labelled, in English, with your host family's name and address. 
just in case they go missing on the way. It has been known to happen. What name do I write, by the way? It's Wark. Lewis and Amy Wark. So that's W-A-L-K? <laughs> it's actually W-A-R-K. But we'll be posting full details to you later this week. Right, fine. And I'd better put some essentials in my hand luggage. Enough for a night or two in case, as you say, anything happens to my main cases. <laughs> yes. I'd recommend a change of T-shirt and socks and so on, plus any medication you may need, and a toothbrush, of course. And my tights. <laughs> Your tights? Yes, for the flight. Wearing them helps prevent deep vein thrombosis when you're <sighs> flying long distances, not getting any exercise. Oh, yes, I've heard about that. Now, talking about exercise, there's one last thing. When you've packed your baggage, check you can carry it, all of it, at least 500 metres without any help. You may have to do that. OK. Well, thanks for all your help. You've cleared up a lot of points. <laughs> You're welcome. Have a safe journey, and we'll look forward to seeing you next month. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear Joanne describing her home city of Darwin in Australia to a man called Rob, who hopes to go there. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Joanne? Hi, you must be Rob. Nice to meet you. So I hear you're planning to visit Australia. Yeah, and I really wanted to talk to you because I was thinking of spending some time in Darwin and my sister told me you're from there. That's right. So tell me about it. Well, where shall I start? Well... Darwin's in what they call the top end because it's right up at the northern end of Australia and it's quite different from the rest of Australia in terms of cultural influences. In fact, it's nearer to Jakarta in Indonesia than it is to Sydney, so you get a very strong Asian influence there. That means we get lots of tourists. People from other parts of Australia are attracted by this sort of international cosmopolitan image. And as well as that... We've got the same laid-back atmosphere you get all over Australia, probably more so, if anything, because of the climate. But what a lot of the tourists don't realise until they get there is that the city's also got a very young population. The average age is just 29, and this makes the whole place very buzzy. Some people think that there might not be that much going on as far as art and music and dancing and so on are concerned because it's so remote. I mean, we don't really get things like theatre and opera in the same way as cities down in the south like Sydney, for example, because of the transport expenses. But in fact, what happens is that we just do it ourselves lots of people play music, classical as well as pop, and there are things like artists' groups and writers' groups and dance classes. Everyone does something. We don't just sit and watch other people. 
You said it's very international? Yeah, they say there's over 70 different nationalities in Darwin. For instance, there's been a Chinese population there for over 100 years. We've even got a Chinese temple. It was built way back in 1887, but um, when a very bad storm, a, a cyclone in fact, hit Darwin in the 1970s, it was almost completely destroyed. The only parts of the temple that survived were part of the altars and the stone lions. But after the storm, they reconstructed it using modern materials. It's still used as a religious centre today, but it's open to tourists too, and it's definitely worth going to see it. Oh, and as far as getting around goes, you'll see places that advertise bicycles for hire, but I wouldn't recommend it. A lot of the year it's just so hot and humid. Some tourists think it'll be fine because there's not much in the way of hills and the traffic's quite light compared with some places, but believe me, you're better off with public transport. It's fine and not expensive. Or you can hire a car, but it's not really worth it. What's the swimming like? Well, there are some good beaches, but the trouble is that there's this nasty creature called the box jellyfish, and if it stings you, you're in bad trouble. So you have to be very careful most of the year, especially in the winter months. You can wear a lycra suit to cover your arms and legs, but I wouldn't like to risk it even so, personally. And there are the saltwater crocodiles too. I mean, I don't want to put you off. There are protected swimming areas netted off where you'll be safe from jellyfish and crocs, or there are the public swimming pools. They're fine, of course. You now have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. So which places would you specially recommend? Well, one of the most popular attractions is called Aquacene. What happens is every day at high tide, hundreds of fish come in from the sea, all different sorts, including some really big deep sea fish. And some of them will even take food from your hand. It's right in the middle of town at the end of the Esplanade. It's not free. I think you have to pay about $5, but it's definitely something you have to experience. Then, of course, Darwin has a great range of food. Being such a cosmopolitan place, and if you don't have lots to spend, the best place to go is to Smith Street Mall, where they have stalls selling stuff to eat. There's all sorts of different things, including Southeast Asian dishes, which I really like. You'd think there'd be plenty of fresh fish in Darwin, as it's on the coast, but in fact, because of the climate, it mostly gets frozen straight away. But you can get fresh fish in the restaurants on Cullen Bay Marina. It's a nice place to go for a special meal, and they have some good shops in that area too. What else? Well, there's the Botanic Garden. It's over 100 years old, and there's lots to see. An orchid farm, rainforest a collection of palm trees, uh, a wetlands area. You can easily spend an afternoon there. That's at Fanny Bay, a couple of kilometres out to the north. Then if you've got any energy left in the evening, the place to go is Mitchell Street. That's where it all happens as far as clubs and music and things are concerned. You'll bump into lots of my friends there. Talking of friends, why don't I give you some email addresses? I'm sure they wouldn't mind... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear an expert on birds talking about sparrows, one of the most common bird species in urban and suburban environments around the world. The expert discusses some possible causes for their declining numbers. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Some people dislike sparrows and see them as annoying pests in their neighbourhood. Others see them as an interesting part of the urban environment. Love them or hate them, it could be that the familiar scene of these birds flying, hopping, and chirping in our city streets will soon become a thing of the past. Until recently, there were so many sparrows around that people tried all kinds of methods to get rid of them. But it now seems that many people are starting to worry about the declining numbers of sparrows in many cities around the world. Over the past twenty or thirty years, sparrows have been disappearing throughout many parts of the world. In Britain, since the 1920s, the overall population of sparrows has declined by 92 percent. In London, they were once so plentiful that people who conducted regular surveys did not bother to count them because they were simply too common. Now there are none. This decline has also been recorded in some cities in continental Europe, parts of North America, and India as well. Some people will be surprised at this, as they probably still see many sparrows in their local neighbourhood. But whereas some suburbs may have large numbers of sparrows, in the next suburb there may be none. So, why are they disappearing rapidly in some areas, yet still exist in large numbers in others? Well, it is a bit of a mystery. Some say it is due to local issues. There are a number of factors here, one of which is harassment or predation. Other local animal species harass them, and domestic cats hunt them for food. Secondly, there is increased competition both for food and for nesting sites from other seed-eating birds in the neighbourhood. And thirdly, it is now more difficult for sparrows to make nests in modern buildings due to more effective modern building methods. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-seven to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-seven to thirty. Recent studies suggest that another reason may be related to a problem with the breeding success of the sparrows. Although they continue to breed, the young nestlings keep dying. These deaths have been linked to a lack of insects, such as aphids. This decrease in the availability of insects, it is believed, then causes the young nestlings to die of starvation or dehydration. It seems that there is a growing worldwide shortage of insects, and our modern urban lifestyle, with the increasing use of motor vehicles, is being blamed for it. It is suggested that the carcinogenic chemicals released into the atmosphere by unleaded car exhaust fumes is having an impact on insect numbers. Another theory, which is thought to be affecting sparrow numbers, is connected to our technological advancement. According to some experts, the mobile telephone towers that are now a feature of our modern cities emit electromagnetic radiation, which might affect the sparrow's central nervous systems and result in their death. The evidence is only circumstantial. And sparrows still continue to thrive in some major cities. However, it is interesting to note that in the 1990s, the use of mobile phones and unleaded petrol skyrocketed, and both coincide with the period of the sparrows' declining numbers in many modern cities. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecturer talking about the solar eclipse in history. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to thirty-six. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to thirty-six. Good evening and welcome to this month's Observatory Club lecture. I'm Donald Mackey and I'm here to talk to you about the solar eclipse in history. A thousand years ago, a total eclipse of the sun was a terrifying religious experience. But these days, an eclipse is more likely to be viewed as a tourist attraction than as a scientific or spiritual event. People will travel literally miles to be in the right place at the right time to get the best view of their eclipse. Well, what exactly causes a solar eclipse when the world goes dark for a few minutes in the middle of the day? Scientifically speaking, the dark spot itself is easy to explain. It's the shadow of the moon streaking across the Earth. This happens every year or two, each time along a different and, to all intents and purposes, a seemingly random piece of the globe. In the past, people often interpreted an eclipse as a danger signal heralding disaster. And in fact, the Chinese were so disturbed by these events that they included among their gods one whose job it was to prevent eclipses. But whether or not you're superstitious or take a purely scientific view, our earthly eclipses are special in three ways. Firstly, there can be no doubt that they're very beautiful. It's as if a deep blue curtain had fallen over the daytime sky as the sun becomes a black void surrounded by the glow of its outer atmosphere. But beyond this, total eclipses possess a second more compelling beauty in the eyes of us scientists, for they offer a unique opportunity for research. Only during an eclipse can we study the corona and other dim things that are normally lost in the sun's glare. And thirdly, they are rare. Even though an eclipse of the sun occurs somewhere on Earth every year or two, if you sit in your garden and wait, it will take 375 years on average for one to come to you. If the moon were any larger, eclipses would become a monthly bore. If it were smaller, they simply would not be possible. The ancient Babylonian priests, who spent a fair bit of time staring at the sky, had already noted that there was an eighteen-year pattern in their occurrence, but they didn't have the mathematics to predict an eclipse accurately. In the second part, the speaker talks about a number of scientists. Look at questions thirty-seven to forty. Now listen carefully and complete the table. It was Edmund Halley, the English astronomer, who knew his maths well enough to predict the return of the comet, which incidentally bears his name, and in 1715 he became the first person to make an accurate eclipse prediction. This brought eclipses firmly into the scientific domain, and they've since allowed a number of important scientific discoveries to be made. For instance, in the eclipse of 1868, two scientists, Janssen and Lockyer, were observing the sun's atmosphere, and it was these observations that ultimately led to the discovery of a new element. They named the element helium, after the Greek god of the sun. 
This was a major find, because helium turned out to be the most common element in the universe after hydrogen. Another great triumph involved mercury. I'll just put that up on the board for you now. See, there's Mercury, the planet closest to the Sun, then Venus, Earth, etc. For centuries, scientists had been unable to understand why Mercury appeared to rotate faster than it should. Some astronomers suggested that there might be an undiscovered planet causing this unusual orbit, and even gave it the name Vulcan. During the eclipse of 1878, an American astronomer, James Watson, thought he'd spotted this so-called lost planet. But, alas for him, he was later obliged to admit that he'd been wrong about Vulcan and withdrew his claim. Then Albert Einstein came on the scene. Einstein suggested that, rather than being wrong about the number of planets, astronomers were actually wrong about gravity. Einstein's theory of relativity, for which he's so famous, disagreed with Newton's law of gravity in just the right way to explain Mercury's odd orbit. He also realized that a definitive test would be possible during the total eclipse of 1919, and this is indeed when his theory was finally proved correct. So, there you have several examples of how eclipses have helped to increase our understanding of the universe. And now let's move on to the social aspects. And I think you'll find... That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.